Hey there guys, alright, today we are back with some more of the Great War, this time we're on a week 37. This totally will not get people in my comment section. They even have their comment section turned off on this video. I've never seen them do that before on this channel, at least so far that I've seen, that I've paid attention to. This is the Armenian Genocide. Now if anyone goes into the comment section and tries to deny the fact of the Armenian Genocide, you will be banned. No hesitation. So, now that I have put the line in the sand, it's not moving. Got it? Because it happened. It happened just like the Genocide of the Jews, just like the Holocaust. It happened like the Native American Genocides. The Rwandan genocide. Okay. Yeah, at that. Internet. Alright. Now before we dive in, make sure you go and check out the links in the description box. I would love it if you join the Discord. As long as you are not a genocide denier. Now let's go ahead and dive right in. April 9th, 1915. How much worse could the war get? In just eight months, we've seen the frightening, destructive power of new artillery and modern machine guns. We've seen the war in the skies and beneath the seas develop. We've seen gas and flamethrowers make their appearance. And we've seen epidemic disease and millions of refugees on the move. So how much worse could it get? I'll tell you in one word. Genocide. I wonder why they're... I wonder if they're censoring that because maybe YouTube would have censored their video if they didn't? It's the only thing I can think of. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to The Great War. Last week, we saw the Austro-Hungarian army grimly trying to hold on against the Russian juggernaut in the Carpathian Mountains. The war in the skies and beneath the seas had claimed new victims. Bulgarian Turks had invaded Serbia, and the Russian cavalry had held off its German counterpart far to the north. It Tarogan. was really in the That's mountains, though, that the worst of the fighting had been taking place, and this week was no different. The third Austro-Hungarian Winter Carpathian Offensive had ground to a halt in late March, and the Austrians were now playing defense and not playing it very well. The Russians were pushing them back down towards the Hungarian plains, and things looked grim for Austria, but just when it seemed darkest, German reinforcements finally arrived. Now, here's a quote from German General Erich Ludendorff. In reading the deceitful reports from the Austrian general staff, the Austrians are not really fighting against numerical superiority. The officer corps is incapable of resistance. The Austrians retreat without battle. We will support them or be beaten. Because of the Balkans, we cannot allow them to be defeated. That was, by this time, a quite common German perception of the Austrian military. <laughs> that Germany was going to have to keep bailing out their ally if they wanted a victory of any kind. And so the newly formed Beskiden Corps, organized specifically to fight in the frozen mountains, was sent to save Austria's bacon under the command of Georg von der Marwitz. They arrived in the nick of time, where the Russians advanced along the entire front on April 4th, Easter Sunday, penetrating dun, dun, the Rostocki Pass. Their front lines actually reached Hungarian territory. Oh, dang, I almost timed this pretty good. Last week, well, from when I'm recording this, uh, last weekend was Easter weekend. Dang, look at that. Five miles from the foot of the pass. But 30 miles away, just south of the Carpathians, the Germans gathered. And on April 6th, launched their counteroffensive, capturing 6,000 Russian prisoners on the first day of battle. The Russians were pushed out of the Varava Valley, and the Austrians had a few days of breathing space. But still, at the end of the week, on April 9th, the Russians held the entire mountain crest from Dukla to Usok, over 100 kilometers long, and they were again pushing forward. Here's a side note. On Easter Sunday, unarmed Russian troops climbed out of their trenches on one of the Austrian fronts and presented gifts to their opponents. Some German troops attempted the same thing on the Western Front, but they were warned off by the British. There would be no Easter truce on the Western Front. Aww. Indeed, this week in the West saw the French make progress throughout the week. E well, at least that was somewhat wholesome. The British were like, no, 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 don't do it. Because we can't do it. We can't, we can't do it. Or whatever. At least, at least the British did that. Good job, Britain. 
east of Verdun and in Alsace, and at the end of the week, captured Les Eparges. But while there was scattered action in the west and heavy action in the east, there was important action this week on one of the home fronts, Vienna, where the imperial court was making overtures to Italy, offering territory in exchange for continuing Italian neutrality. Now, the empire offered Rovereto, Riva, Tion, and the Borgo district up to Lavis for a guarantee. Italy then demanded, in addition, the Dalmatian Islands, Trentino, oh. Gorizia, Gradisca, the renunciation of all Austrian interests in Albania, recognition of Italian sovereignty over Valona, Trieste to be an independent state. Italy would pay the empire 200 million lira, and then Italy would not only remain neutral, but would join the Central Powers actively in the war. Oh. Austrian army. You know what? I thought for a second that was going to be like their demands to remain just neutral. But to join the Central Powers? That doesn't sound too bad, from, in my opinion, especially when, you know, you're the Austro-Hungarians and you are losing to the Russians in your own mountains. So, you know, I would take that deal. But, of course, we know the Austro-Hungarians are full of incompetent leaders, so... Army Chief of Staff we know Comrade von Hotzendorf was really worried about Italy invading by this point, and there was certainly not much chance of defending against Italy or Romania as things stood, with all of those Austrian troops under heavy and constant fire on the Eastern Front. Who would do the defending? Conrad reportedly even made a threat to the Germans that he might negotiate a peace with the Russians so he could deal with Italy, and the Italian question grew and grew. A peace with Russia might have been a life-saving option for anyone at this point, for Russia was also advancing on its most southerly front this week, defeating the Turks at Olti on the 4th and entering Artvin on the 6th. Both of these towns lie in the Ottoman region of Armenia, where things were getting ugly. On April 8th, the deportation and massacres of Armenian citizens of the Ottoman Empire began. Most Armenians put the beginning of the Armenian genocide two weeks later on the 24th, but this was the day when the deportations began in Zeytun in Cilicia. The Turks were increasingly bitter about their continual losses of men and land against the Russians in the Caucasus, especially the humiliation of the Battle of Sarakamish. The Armenians were not only a convenient scapegoat, but there were many thousands of ethnic Armenians serving in the Russian army, and they were branded as traitors. Talat Pasha, Minister of the Interior, and one of the three Pashas, together with Enver and Jamal, who basically ruled the Ottoman Empire during the war, had this to say in a coded telegram. The objective that the government expects to achieve by the expelling of the Armenians from the areas in which they live and their transportation to other appointed areas is to ensure that this community will no longer be able to undertake initiatives and actions against the government and that they will be brought to a state in which they will be unable to pursue their national aspirations related to advocating a government of Armenia. Two months earlier, after Sarakamish, Enver Pasha had blamed his army's crushing defeat on Armenian traitors, and later that month had transferred all Armenian soldiers in the Ottoman army into unarmed labor battalions. You'd think that with the British and French obviously preparing for an invasion of Ottoman territory, the Pashas would need every soldier they could get, but there you mm -hmm. have it. And this week, on the 6th, both battleships and airplanes bombarded Smyrna on the Anatolian west coast. That was Asian territory, and the war was again hot on three continents this week, as down in East Africa, the Germans were defeated at Karunga, and also in Southwest Africa, where South African forces took Barmbad. And that was the week. The French gaining ground in the west, the Austrians finally being reinforced, but still trying to contain the Russians, who were making headway themselves in the Caucasus, and the Ottoman triumvirate began a program intended as consolidation. The Armenian community yeah, had been fairly autonomous under the leadership of its religious patriarch within the Ottoman Empire, but they were, and had been for centuries, second-class citizens, and their only real freedom was freedom of worship. Indeed, there had been massacres of Armenians in the mid-1890s oh. and again in 1909. Actually, one cause of tension that's often overlooked is the fact that the Ottoman Empire lost virtually all of its European territory between 1878 and 1912. This resulted in over three quarters of a million Muslim refugees from those territories coming to Turkish regions that had a large Armenian Christian presence. 
who were well off compared to the new arrivals, which fostered increasing resentment. And many adherents of the new nationalism, which visualized a modern Turkish nation that didn't look to the Arab world for guidance, but looked rather to itself, did not see that nation including millions of Armenian Christians. There were actually many intellectuals of the new movement who believed that all minorities, Armenian, Greek, Circassian, and so forth, did belong in a modern Turkey. But they were not the three Pashas. One of these no, three, they weren't. Minister of War Enver Pasha, had brought the empire into the war and was in charge of the catastrophe at Sarakamish. But all three were guilty of this, the death and deportation of thousands upon thousands of their own countrymen. Just when you thought the war couldn't get any worse, that there weren't any more ways to murder and maim, that it was bad enough when an enemy came at you with machine guns and bombs, now you could be killed by your own government just for existing. Welcome to modern war. At times, this war also created something surprisingly beautiful. And one of these stories happened on Christmas 1914. Oh, there. Soldiers okay. That, yeah, nothing really to add on here for this video. This is one of those somber videos. Um, that was the Armenian Genocide. Great War, Week 37. I'm not going to ask. I'm not going to say. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Because Talking about genocide is rough. So, I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.